Good evening, everybody. This is Jess Middendorf. I'm looking forward to getting started in uh, two or three minutes. So glad you can join us. We'll be ready to study the fruit of the Spirit, uh, peace. If ever we needed peace, it's right now. Good evening, everyone. It's a privilege to be together again tonight for the uh, third in our series on the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, tonight, we're going to be studying about the uh, fruit that we call peace. I'm glad you've joined us. Uh, if you've had the opportunity to read the participants' uh, text for tonight, you'll realize it's quite a quite an evening and. Uh, We've got a lot to talk about. It's Holy Week. We're in the middle of uh, the coronavirus epidemic. We are facing uncertainty as to how this will, this uh, epidemic or the pandemic will uh, finish up. No doubt there will be many who are hoping there will be an announcement that one day it is over. The reality is this is likely to roll out slowly. And there'll be more uncertainty and perhaps a bit of ambiguity in all of this. Uh, it, will, it will work on our peace. It will make it hard for us at uh, almost every juncture as we try to find our way through all of this. So is there any hope? I have good news tonight. There is hope, great grand hope. As I mentioned, this is Holy Week. Uh, tomorrow, Monday, Thursday, and uh, Friday, Good Friday, we sometimes call it. It's good for us. It certainly was not an enjoyable experience for what our Savior was going through. So I want us to uh, be aware tonight as we study together that this peace we are talking about, a peace that he talked with his disciples about, on the evening before he was betrayed, he talked about peace. And it's that peace that we're going to be talking about this evening in this uh, uh, session that I hope will be very beneficial for all of us. I am so glad you've joined us. Uh, if there are those who would like uh, to share this video with a small group for a later viewing and working together, it, of course, will be available on the Foundry Publishing uh, website and uh, on their Facebook page, you can find it there. So I hope that you will take this to others and share it with them. I know that some small groups meet with us here and following the session we have together, those groups meet and uh, do additional study in their own right. And uh, many of them, most of them, in fact, by uh, uh, video conference in a variety of ways. So we're grateful you could be a part of this tonight. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, in this evening, as we turn again to your word and go to the letter of Paul to the Galatian church, we are reminded that if ever there was a time when we needed the gift of your peace, we need it right now. But Lord, I want to give you thanks that it is in the midst of the turmoil that your peace is available 
to us. We want to talk about that tonight, Lord. We need your wisdom and your guidance as we share together. So bless us as we talk about peace. In the strong name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, as we uh, get underway with this, let's go back to the Word. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. And don't live like those who will not inherit the kingdom of God, said Paul. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. All of those things that he describes then roll out as a part of the life of in Christ, life in the Spirit, as he admonished the Galatians just a few verses before this, keep in step with the Spirit. As we talk about the whole concept of peace at this stage, we need to understand that uh, there are a variety of ways that we might approach this concept. In the Old Testament, uh, peace was often referenced. In fact, if you have a a Bible with a concordance, uh, one of the Bibles I use quite often is the uh, Zondervan edition of the New International Version, the 2015 uh, edits. And uh, if you have that concordance, go to the concordance to the references for peace. It would be a really worthwhile thing for you to do to just go through all of them Take some time to read through all of those scriptures that are referenced and look at the passage and its context to get a a grasp of the the breadth of this idea that we are talking about when we talk about peace. Uh, Paul is writing uh, in Greek. He's writing to Greek speakers, a Gentile church. Uh, There might have been, well, it's obvious there were probably Uh, Jewish Christians as well as Gentile Christians. There was a great deal of conflict as to how you become Christian, how you remain Christian. Uh, In uh, the the view of some, you had to go back to all the requirements of the law. You had to be Jewish first, and then you could be Christian. For Paul, that was not the thing that he wanted them to know. He wanted them to know that in Christ, the law is fulfilled and we live our lives in response to what Christ has done for us by faith and not by the works of the law. But does that mean that there is no requirement for holy living? If it's all by grace and all by faith, is there anything required of us? Well, Paul makes it quite clear in this passage that um, though we live by the law without depending on the law, it is, it is uh, a responsibility that we have to respond to grace. Grace is always prior, always prior. Grace is the very thing that enables our response. And this grace is important as a part of our understanding of how peace is at work. You'll notice that in all but one of the letters of Paul, in his greeting to whomever he's writing, whether it's an individual like Titus or Philemon or to the churches, he has a greeting that says, grace and peace to you. Sometimes grace, mercy, and peace, as he spoke uh, to uh, uh, young Timothy at one point. Grace and peace. You get the idea that peace was a crucial concept for the Christian to understand. And for Paul, as he writes, he's writing in the Greek, and the the Greek term, peace, irene, we would uh, spell it in the English transliteration, E-I-R-E-N-E, irene. In the Hebrew, uh, and a similar word in the Aramaic that Jesus perhaps was speaking when he spoke of peace, you would hear the word shalom. Shalom. When Jesus appeared to the disciples on the evening of the resurrection and appeared behind the locked doors, they were terrified. And the first words of Jesus to the terrified disciples who had somehow discounted the news that Mary had brought, he, she had seen the Lord, 
he is alive. But they were still behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. I've often laughed at that. If the Jews knew what they inside that door knew, the Jews would have nailed the door shut because if they ever got out with that news, the world would be turned upside down. So Jesus walked in and his words to them were, peace be to you. I have an idea that he actually used that Hebrew or Aramaic term, shalom. Shalom was more than just peace. Shalom was wholeness, health, fullness of being. Well, there were some references in which shalom is used where it's talking about uh, the, the good setting in which a person uh, is existing at that moment, uh, that they are in a setting that is called a shalom. It's a peaceful place. Uh, sometimes shalom had to do with uh, uh, they were in the right place. It was an appropriate setting for them. So it was the shalom. But often when the term shalom was used, it meant far more than that. It, it had breadth. It had depth. It had to do with how life was being filled with the very life of God. Shalom. What must it have been like for those disciples that night to hear Jesus say, Shalom? They thought they were seeing a ghost. He showed them his hands and his feet. He assured them that it was him. And then he said a second time, Shalom. I have an idea this time they were a bit more able to receive it. And it was in that setting that we have so much that occurred in that brief encounter in that room, which had been behind locked doors, where the gathered followers of Jesus trying to get their minds around what they had been hearing and not being quite sure how to respond to one another when Jesus walked in and said, peace be to you, shalom. I think sometimes we need to understand the extent to which this was not just a sentimental imperative. This was not Jesus saying to the disciples, don't worry, be happy. Like the uh, song of a few years ago that was so popular here in the U.S. and around the world, a uh, fun song, I, I, I loved hearing it. But I thought at the time, if only you knew, there's much more to just simply don't worry, be happy. It is not a wishful thinking kind of thing. When Jesus spoke to the disciples on the evening of his betrayal, he said to them in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 27, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. Not peace as the world gives it. And then he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Paul was offering them peace, or rather Jesus was offering them peace, was giving them peace. But it was peace in the midst of a coming storm. And what he was assuring them was that peace is so far more than an emotional moment of good feelings. The peace that Jesus gives, the peace available to you and to me as a fruit of the presence of the Holy Spirit is something that abides deep within us. It is a product of, a fruit of, what Jesus talked about earlier in the Gospel of John, when he talked about abiding in me. If you abide in me, if you dwell in me, if you live in me, if you will allow my word to live in you. This is not the promise that there will never be problems. This is not the promise that there will never be agony, anguish, turmoil. This is not the assurance that once you become a believer, everything is going to be okay. 
I, as a young pastor, used to say to young people, follow the will of God. It will be the safest decision you ever made. I quit saying that. When it dawned on me in my own journey and in the journey of the people to whom I served as pastor, that the journey to follow Christ passionately was anything but safe. In fact, it would cost you everything. But in surrendering everything to him, there comes that reservoir of hope, of help, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to this passage in Galatians for a moment. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. This comes not because we work it up in our own resources. This is not something we produce. This is something we receive. This, you see, is not, this peace is not circumstantial. It is a new assurance that in whatever the circumstances we find ourselves, he will be with us. It's more than a promise. It is a deep underlying assurance. Peace is not circumstantial. Peace is relational. Let me open that up for a moment. Peace that is relational means it, it flows out of our relationship with him. It comes from him by his spirit indwelling us. The peace is the undergirding strength of God that enables us to rest in him even in the worst moments. It's part of the reason that John Wesley would say of the Methodists during his lifetime, our people die well. Even in the moments of anguish and agony and pain, there was deep within a reservoir, a well of resource that was Christ himself by his spirit indwelling. It's a phenomenal resource, a reality for us. And if we understand the extent to which when we are keeping in step with the Spirit, when we are abiding in Christ, Christ's Word is abiding in us. The inevitability of that is a resource, the Spirit who brings the peace. In our world right now, uh, there's not a lot of peace in a lot of places. I listened to the governor of New York. His heart breaking at times, his voice breaking as he describes what is going on. And he talked to the Jewish community about the loss of the ability to gather in the celebration of Passover. I've heard pastors talk about the loss we feel and the inability to gather for the celebration of Easter. I've heard others talk about how difficult it will be for us to imagine how in all of this going on with the number of people who are contracting or contacting, becoming infected by this virus and the number of deaths that are occurring, how do we find peace in this? Our peace is not circumstantial. Our peace is relational. It is because he has come that we have this peace. You see, I'm, I'm afraid sometimes we want the assurance that if we'll follow Jesus, everything will work out well. In the last analysis, it will. In the meantime, we go through difficult times. This is one of those times. And my prayer for all of us, my prayer for the Church of Jesus Christ, my prayer for every pastor, oh, I've been in 
touch with many of our pastors who are in such anguish over this, and there's, there's not a great deal of peace for many of them until we begin to discuss what is our message to our people. Our message is, even if we can't gather together to say to one another, he is risen, oh, he is risen indeed, we have the capacity, if we want to do it, to stand on our front doorsteps and say, he is risen. And I have no doubt that somewhere down the street, someone might just respond, he is risen indeed. Because our message is about the one who came, who gave himself for us, who suffered and died on our behalf, who was raised on the third day and ascended to the Father. And he is the one who promised us my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. He gives us peace that passes all understanding. Oh, sometimes it will be peace in the midst of a storm. Other times it will be peace that will be so tangible we will be grateful beyond our ability to express it. And in between those times, we will walk with him in peace. I would love to hear the discussions across all of the groups following this. There are questions that are found in the leader's guide. I hope you'll delve into them. Some questions that come up in the participant's guide, some excellent questions that guide us in considering this. Let's, let's remember this. Peace is not an emotion. Peace is a gift. It grows out of a relationship. And the power of the relationship is the presence of the Holy Spirit, who, when he dwells in us, brings to bear in our lives the same power, according to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That is the source of our peace. Well, may his peace be with you. And may this be a time these next three days as we lean toward Easter Sunday, when on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Silent Saturday, we contemplate in the midst of the coronavirus, the peace that Jesus gives. I think we'll have a reason to sing on Easter Sunday morning. He lives, he lives. I know he lives because he lives within my heart. Thanks be to God. Take his peace. And I will talk next week with you as we talk about in the midst of this coronavirus, patience. Oh, Lord, help us to be patient. God bless you.